uh, I'd also like to thank the uh, Academy for this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk about some of our work. Um, we are, of course, uh, uh, situated at uh, Pune at the Indian Institute for uh, Science, Education and Research. And uh, we've been working towards uh, this uh, fairly fascinating uh, area of cell biology, um, which gets you to understand how uh, cells become more complex, um, uh, compartmentalizing their cytoplasm into uh, different uh, spaces. Um, so uh, just briefly, uh, when you talk about membrane fission, um, we, of course, refer to a process uh, that's very prevalent in all living systems. Uh, and this is a process by which uh, the cytoplasm of cells gets compartmentalized into tiny entities or units. Uh, and each of these units have a, a limiting membrane uh, that is uh, that basically ensures that uh, they retain their specific chemistry, manage their specific reactions into these units. So um, this is very prevalent in uh, eukaryotic uh, uh, cellular systems where uh, you have the birth of uh, various organelles. This is a process by which you package proteins and uh, small molecules into vesicular entities. And this is how the cell manages to transport a lot of uh, uh, proteins and membranes and small molecules across uh, the various spaces of the cell. Um, one striking example of when uh, membrane fission manifests is uh, in how organelles uh, divide. So every time the cell has to divide, organelles uh, that are extremely tubular and form a network in them also undergo division. Uh, and this is again a, a reflection of an orchestrated process of uh, membrane fission. And, uh, Possibly the most uh, ancient form of membrane fission uh, pertains to the ability for cells to divide as well, uh, which is you consider two cells which are enclosed in their plasma membranes. There is an orchestrated event whereby you see a splitting of uh, the tiny junction that holds these two cells together. Uh, and that also is uh, considered uh, to come within the purview of uh, the process of uh, membrane fission. So. Um, the approach that we've been taking is to try and understand the mechanism of uh, how cells manage uh, this process. Uh, now, obviously, the cell is a very complex entity, um, and uh, one approach that has been uh, uh, that has yielded many results uh, is a reductionist approach. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, reductionism not to the extent of what, let's say, uh, Seema Sharma, a previous speaker, was talking about. That is breaking atoms down into uh, elementary particles. Uh, but here, a reductionist approach would mean isolating reactions out of the complex environment of the cell, understanding how protein molecules manage to orchestrate some of these reactions. And in order to do that, you need to isolate some of these so-called fission uh, uh, events or phenomena uh, outside of the cell. And that uh, takes you to uh, an area of biology, which is uh, frequently referred to as uh, reconstitution which is you piece together uh, purified components and see emergence of uh, some kind of a, a phenomena or a, a property. Now, when it pertains to membrane fission, the scheme uh, is fairly straightforward, which is you assume you have a single membrane enclosed compartment, which undergoes some kind of a modification in terms of its shape and then splits apart into two separate entities. Uh, think of this process of phenomenon during cell division, then this is exactly what ends up happening. These two daughter uh, cells then grow uh, to size equivalent to the mother cell. And this process uh, uh, keeps on going. And that's how you end up uh, having um, uh, uh, multiplication of cells. Now, in this case, it's it's very important to emphasize why uh, it's uh, required. Th this kind of analysis requires the development of proper assays. Uh, if you think about it, the reverse process is uh, frequently referred to as membrane fusion. And everything we know about how viruses infect cells and fuse with the plasma membrane has come about from very simple yet very powerful and elegant uh, assays, uh, which are reported in the 1980s to uh, allow for us to understand the process, the reverse process of two vesicles fusing with one another to form a larger entity. And we, of course, are referring to the opposite process, which is the splitting of uh, a single uh, membrane bound compartment into two. And uh, in this regard, um, we've been working towards generating some of these assays uh, that would allow us to investigate this phenomenon with uh, higher precision. And I was referring to uh, this idea or this approach of uh, reconstitution biology and uh, possibly the most famous 
uh, example is uh, was uh, the one that is put forward by Arthur Kornberg. Um, he's obviously credited for reconstituting the reactions that lead to uh, multiplication or duplication of uh, the DNA. Um, he basically isolated the DNA polymerase enzyme that makes more of uh, DNA uh, and uh, convinced people that you could take this protein in isolation in a test tube, provide it with the right reagents, and it could carry out the same functions that uh, presumably this protein carries out inside of the complex environment of the cell. Now, Arthur Kornberg, with all his immense uh, wisdom and uh, experience, also put out this lovely set of uh, what he calls the Ten Commandments of Reconstitution Biology. And one of these is extremely important in the area that we are focused on, which is to not never to waste clean enzymes on dirty substrates. And this emphasizes the importance of uh, thinking through with a proper assay before you start understanding membrane fission. Now, we've taken, uh, we've been inspired by living systems and how it manages to form vesicles and how it manages to orchestrate fission. And uh, one such pathway is where uh, this is uh, basically a thin cross section of the cell. And this dark colored entity that you see is the outermost, the limiting membrane, the plasma membrane of the cell. And you've got events where cells end up forming vesicles from this plasma membrane. It starts off by the membrane becoming very initially uh, being very planar. Uh, there are a dedicated sets of, set of proteins that get recruited from the cytoplasm in, in, and in the process it ends, ends up sculpting uh, a bud-like structure from the plasma membrane. Um, as a bud uh, uh, becomes more well-defined, you automatically end up forming a tiny neck and fission takes place of this tiny neck and that's how you release the vesicle. Um, this is a pathway which is, uh, as far as the design principles of this pathway are concerned, this is extremely conserved. Uh, your viruses also enter uh, cells in exactly the same uh, sort of a mechanism. And uh, it's remarkable as to how, as far as design uh, principles are concerned, uh, there seems to be not too many ways of making a vesicle uh, out of uh, membranes. So if you follow through uh, with this uh, scheme of uh, events, and if you focus on this uh, an ultimate stage right before fission. Look at the structure uh, and imagine this in three dimensions. Uh, it's uh, a sort of like a membrane tube. Uh, and uh, we thought if we could start looking at uh, fission reactions by providing these kind of tubular membrane templates, uh, then could we understand the process of uh, fission in uh, greater detail? And uh, it's really not very easy uh, and straightforward to make these tubular uh, membrane templates. And we've been working uh, towards making this in a high throughput and a simpler uh, uh, manner. And uh, that constitutes our uh, fission assay. And the, the, the method by which you make membrane tubes is very straightforward. Um, you start with a passivated glass cover slip and you dry some lipids in an organic solvent on one end of this glass cover slip. You wait for the organic solvent to dry off and you have a, a dry lipid layer uh, that's present on the glass cover slip. You take this cover slip and place it inside a flow cell and the moment you flow in buffer or water uh, because of the hydrophobic effect all this dry lipid ends up uh, spontaneously self-assembling into uh, vesicles. Uh, you use the same uh, flow cell format um, flow buffer at ex extremely high flow rates and the, the force that's exerted because of the high flow rate ends up extruding these uh, vesicles into very long membrane tubes. The tubes are tethered to the region where you uh, where you spotted these, um, uh, where you spotted the lipid, and uh, the region where you spotted the lipid gets transformed into a nice supported bilayer, a single lipid bilayer, and downstream of that you have this long array of uh, 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 of uh, tubes that are laid out on the glass cover slip. Now, since all of this reaction is housed inside a flow cell, you make your templates inside of the flow cell, and you flow in uh, your molecule of choice or a collection of molecules of choice and then ask questions whether or not they are capable of uh, catalyzing fission. So um, the advantage with these kind of systems is that um, uh, using very, very rudimentary, very simple fluorescence microscopy based analysis, we have uh, we can uh, come up with very precise estimates of uh, the size of these tubes. And this becomes important because uh, the neck like structures that I described to you before they are typically in the dimensions of uh, tens of nanometers. So you need an extremely thin membrane tube in order for uh, it to serve as a, as a useful model for uh, understanding uh, membrane fission. Um, now, we're obviously starting with very simplified systems. Now, uh, how do you start mimicking uh, cellular membranes? And one way to do that is relevant lipids. 
uh, we know from work from a number of uh, labs that uh, the different cellular organelles inside the cell, each of them have a very unique and a very distinctive lipid composition. And in our templates, we start by incorporating these special lipids into our uh, membrane system to start mimicking these different organelles. We obviously also have the capacity of displaying a protein of choice uh, to start mimicking some of these organelles uh, inside of the cell. Um, and uh, sort of as a proof of concept, uh, I'll just take you uh, uh, through uh, one aspect of our work. Uh, we've been looking at this family of proteins, which are referred to as dynamins. Um, you find dynamins uh, present even in uh, bacterial species, and over the course of evolution, they've expanded in size in terms of um, the diversity of functions that they carry out. Uh, but in terms of functions itself, you can categorize them into four uh, super families. There's a, a family which is uh, endocytic dynamins, which manages making vesicles from the plasma membrane. There is a mitochondrial dynamic which manages organellar division, which is a division of the mitochondria during cell division. Um, there are a class of uh, dynamics which uh, appear to get uh, uh, become functional in response to viral uh, infections. Uh, and a fourth family, which is uh, involved in the opposite reaction of orchestrating membrane fusion rather than uh, membrane fission. So uh, one such uh, family member is an endocytic dynamin, and this is a protein inside every cell of your body that manages to get recruited to these necks of emergent buds from the plasma membrane, does its magic, clips off that neck, and that's how you form vesicles. That's how you're able to take in nutrients. That's how you're able to also internalize large molecules inside of the cell. So we thought if, uh, uh, as a proof of concept, how about uh, we express, purify, work with this endocytic dynamic in isolation and test it on our assay system to see if we are able to understand the process by which it manages this uh, fission reaction. So um, I'll show you uh, one such uh, experiment. Uh, this is a field of the microscope uh, and uh, those long membrane nanotubes that I talked about are laid out here. Uh, they look white because uh, this is a grayscale image. Um, this is a video which I will play shortly. Uh, and you'll see that uh, this is easily about uh, 50 microns long in diameter. Um, and you'll also notice immediately that um, they are of different uh, intensities, and that's because they are of different sizes. Uh, and one of the advantages that one has with these assay systems is to play around with uh, understanding the determinants for these kind of reactions to manifest. Uh, is there a size limitation or a size restriction uh, that dynamic senses? Uh, does it wait, for instance, for that neck to get sculpted just to the right dimensions before it, uh, its activity starts manifesting? So these are some of the questions that one can ask using these templates. And uh, what I'm doing now is uh, playing uh, this movie. This is all inside of the flow cell, and these are these long membrane nanotubes, as I talked about before. And I'm flowing in this purified dynamic onto these membrane templates while I'm recording this movie. And you see, as soon as this protein dynamic hits these membrane templates, you start seeing each of these long membrane tubes getting broken down into tiny bits. So this is a reaction. This is uh, possibly the most simplest uh, reconstitution of a membrane fission reaction managed by just one kind of protein. And the advantage one has with these kind of assays is you would have imagined, you would have seen this for yourself. There are a large number of tubes in, in a single field of view. And there are a large number of events also which one can sample. Uh, and because you're recording a movie, you can play this movie back in time uh, to understand what led to Dynamin managing this kind of a reaction. So you can understand protein function on the membrane. You can understand how the membrane itself yielded to Dynamin's action such that it got broken down into uh, tiny bits. So um, one of the things that we have been doing is to look at each of these events in isolation and playing out these movies, uh, trying to understand what are the conformational changes that get orchestrated into uh, this protein in order for uh, this uh, fission process to take place. We now know for a fact that the primary function of dynamin is it basically ends up forming a polymer around this membrane tube uses GTP hydrolysis uh, or energy from GTP hydrolysis to undergo a series of conformational changes such that it can constrict it even further. Uh, and it constricts it to a point where you end up defining a narrow lumen of around five nanometers in diameter. And that's exactly where the, the tube ends up breaking apart. Uh, 
uh, and it again uses uh, it uses the same GDP hydrolysis to disassemble, and this process can get uh, uh, can get repeated multiple times, provided you have this template uh, available. Of course, in our reactions, the template gets broken up, but you can always uh, make the template all over again, and you see this uh, activity being extremely robust and extremely reproducible. Uh, and with the number of events that we've been able to score, the statistics uh, also gets uh, improved uh, in this whole process. So um, this is our uh, efforts at understanding membrane fission in uh, as far as one particular reaction is concerned, managed by one particular protein. What we, of course, would like to understand is, can we use these assay systems to go on a screen to ask uh, in this complex cellular environment, is there only one protein? Are there multiple proteins? How are they related in terms of function, in terms of mechanism? Uh, and for all of this, uh, our assay systems become very important because the readouts from these assay systems are very straightforward, as you would have seen from the movie that I played just now. Uh, you either see fission or you don't see fission. So it's almost a binary readout. And uh, one can then ask uh, if I picked a, a favorite protein uh, that someone is working on, uh, some other part of the world, for instance, uh, and I threw them onto these kind of assay systems, does it manage this better? Thanks. Uh, so that's been our effort. And uh, in the process, what we have been working on is a wide variety of living systems. And the reason to do this is to be able to sample the diversity of fission uh, proteins or, or molecules inside of the cell that can orchestrate uh, fission. Each of these systems have their own physiology, have their own uh, lipid compositions, uh, have their own methods of making organelles. Uh, and uh, what we would like to understand is the diversity of uh, proteins that manage to make these kind of organelles. And our assays are fairly straightforward. We start with, uh, let's say in this case, the yeast uh, system, for instance. We take yeast, we grow them up into liter cultures and make a lysate out of these cultures, and then add them onto these templates and ask if there's anything inside the lysate that cuts them into tiny bits. Once you identify this kind of an activity, you can go back and isolate this activity and understand this protein in isolation. And we also try and close the loop. We go back to the same E system. We possibly remove that protein from the equation by making a knockout or something and score for some kind of a phenotypic uh, effect. So um, that's been our workflow. And uh, in the process, uh, what it allows you to do is, um, as far as the assay is concerned, and focus on membrane fission as a phenomenon is concerned, uh, these kind of templates uh, establishes a very robust and, uh, and a facile workflow uh, to understand the process. Uh, it obviously sets up the basis for a screen for uh, understanding um, how many proteins are there in a typical uh, organismal uh, context that can manage uh, membrane fission. Uh, a finer analysis, a more uh, sophisticated analysis, allows you to understand uh, the pathway to fission. For instance, in the case of dynamics, we know it manages by constricting the membrane tube. But we've been uh, uh, discovering other molecules that manage to sever uh, membranes in a completely uh, different uh, mechanism altogether. And uh, as it, really, in terms of future, it, it really is a gift that keeps uh, giving. You can uh, use these same assays to expand the repertoire of fission catalysts. And uh, if you go back to complex systems, uh, you have the possibility of understanding where these proteins function uh, in that kind of a complex system. So. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone from the lab who has uh, contributed to uh, all of this work. Uh, we are largely a lab that's comprised of graduate students. Um, and I'd also like to uh, thank all the sources of uh, funding uh, that has made this uh, work possible. Um, and, uh, I'd, I'd like to finish here, and uh, I thank you for your attention. And if I have some time and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to address. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for that fascinating talk. Uh, while I'm looking for the questions, I have a couple of my own, if I can start. Yeah. So what about microsomes? These are some fascinating. Could you tell us something about microsomes? So, uh, is it, are they happening in the same way? I mean, the same processes occurring? So uh, for each of these events, uh, if, you, if you think about the process of uh, how vesicles are formed, and microsomes are just one uh, vesicles of one particular flavor. Uh, there seems to be at least two, in terms of mechanism, there seems to be two specific uh, uh, tiers of functions that uh, by which uh, cells make vesicles. One is there is an upstream uh, function which ends up defining a bud-like structure from a parent membrane. And the budding reaction is very interesting because this is what decides on what are the composition 
or how do you functionalize or what kind of protein molecules you want to sort into forming a mygosome like uh, structure and then secondly is the process of fission um, now uh, we are very far from understanding how you form microsomes uh, uh, we are also very far from understanding what uh, sort of a, a machinery uh, these uh, vesicles utilize to uh, bud off from a, a parent membrane so um, I, I, I must admit, I don't know enough about the process, but uh, I, I, can, I can be fairly uh, confident stating that we don't know the process by which they are formed as far as the fission angle is concerned. Right. So if I can just ask you another question. Um, so is the extrusion process different from an intrusion process? Because if you've got, as you showed us, yeah. Uh, an internal invagination versus, um, you know, so uh, is there a difference? Well, it's a really nice question and uh, very pertinent in the current context of uh, viruses uh, entering. So if you think of the scheme of uh, in terms of topology of the membrane, uh, we've been talking about vesicles that utilize proteins that are present in the cytoplasm to uh, sever uh, this kind of a, a, a bud to form a vesicle. Viruses, on the other hand, end up forming uh, or at least infecting from the outside. The endocytic pathway that takes the virus in, in terms of topology, is very, very similar. But viruses, of course, multiply inside the host cell and bud off. And that topology is the opposite. Uh, and there are, uh, so if you will, in, as far as uh, the templates are concerned, this would be manifested by sets of proteins that would mm -hmm. be working from inside the lumen of the tube. Uh, to catalyze mm -hmm. fission. Um, there are a family of very ancient proteins, uh, these are known as escort uh, proteins, uh, that appear to be involved in managing fission, leading to the exit of uh, or the budding out of uh, these kind of structures from the cell. Uh, and uh, they're, 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 there's, there's tremendous interest uh, in the community to understand how escorts function. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We've been also trying to re-engineer our templates to be able to fill uh, the lumen of these tubes with relevant protein molecules to be able to mm -hmm. understand this opposite uh, budding out kind of a reaction as well. Okay, and my last question before I call on the next speaker, what about archae bacteria and their membranes? Uh, is the process and the molecules similar because they have a different, they don't have this bilayer and stuff, yes. right? So do you want to say anything about archaea bacteria? Do, is it so, uh, the, the archaea, yeah, so the archaea bacteria, uh, the, the membranes are identical uh, and the, the forces, the, the, the phenomenon that makes membranes is encoded in the fact that you start with an amphipathic molecule that self-assembles into forming a bilayer. The chemistry of the lipids is very different, however. Um, there, are they, there are remnants of these kind of lipids present in bacteria, uh, but um, uh, the more evolved species of lipids like the phosphoanacetides are absent in the archaea uh, family of uh, organisms. Uh, there is, uh, a, I, I, I was referring to the escort uh, family of proteins. In fact, archaea uh, bacteria also express escorts. Uh, and they seem to be involved in the cell division side of, uh, um, of uh, mm -hmm. membrane fission in the case of uh, uh, archaea bacteria. So um, okay. I, would, I, would, I think the fundamental nature of the protein may be different, but the mechanisms may be very, very similar across all living uh, forms uh, uh, that manage to form vesicles or manage to divide. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Thomas, for the beautiful talk. And, uh, Yes, thank you.